right. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on what part of the world you are joining <laughs> us from. My name is Alex Faust, your host of Conversations at the Edge. And today I'm very excited to be joined by David Rendell in his pink shirt, in his pink glasses, and his pink light next to him. And I'm sure he'll tell you why he is all decked out in pink. Um, because if you don't know David, during the last 15 years, he's spoken to audiences on every inhabited continent. His clients include the U.S. Air Force, Australian government, Fortune 50 companies such as Microsoft, AT&T, United Health Group, and State Farm. And prior to becoming a speaking professional, he was a leadership professor, stand-up comedian, and nonprofit executive. Uh, in between presentations, he competes in ultra marathons and Ironman triathlons. He has a doctor of management degree in organizational leadership, as well as a graduate degree in psychology. And he's the author of four books, two of which we have courses on at Growth Institute, uh, Four Factors of Effective Leadership, The Freak Factor, The Freak Factor for Kids, and Pink Goldfish 2.0, which is what we're going to be talking about today uh, because his new course is going to be released any day now at Growth Institute. So David, welcome to Conversations at the Edge, and where are you calling in from today? That's the perfect segue because I'm calling in from Goldsboro, North Carolina, which is the home of the somewhat inappropriately named Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, uh, where people fly uh, fighter jets for the U.S. Air Force. And uh, when it's rainy and uh, messy, like it is today, uh, they reroute their planes over our house. So I muted myself as you were doing the intro because uh, we were getting a few sonic booms, basically, as the jets buzzed our... Uh, buzzed our house. So here I am in Goldsboro, North Carolina, just about an hour east of Raleigh. Awesome. Well, we'll know what this what the sound is if we hear something whipping around the here. House. Around here, they call it the sound of freedom. That's what they call it. <laughs> nice. Um, well, I want to jump right in uh, in your new course that will be available to all of our members very soon. You share a pretty interesting quote that only 3% of businesses are actually different and finding key differentiators in the market is incredibly difficult. So I'm wondering how you define different because I feel like if we were to ask the folks who are here, if their business was different, more than 3% would be raising their hand. So how do you consider you know, different in the market? A different really isn't up to us, right? It's up to the customers, right? So it's up to the people who look at it and you say, well, is, you know, McDonald's any different than Wendy's, any different than Burger King, any different than Hardee's? Uh, and they get to decide not, well, you know, our burgers are fresh, not frozen. You know, the question is, does that become a big enough difference? Does that drive anybody's decisions? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, right? Um, so I think that's uh, oftentimes, you know, what part of what I say is if it takes too long for you to explain to me how, how you're different, then you're probably not, right? Well, you see, what you understand is the way this, and people go on and on, it needs to be this sort of instantaneous, obvious a difference that you have that, again, not just a difference you have, but also that draws people in um, and uh, attracts people's attention and attracts their business. Thank you. And just a reminder for the folks who are here live, if you do have questions for David throughout the conversation today, uh, feel free to put them into the chat uh, or into the Q&A, and, and we'll get to those towards the end of our conversation. Um, so, David, I'm curious, like, why are people getting this so wrong uh, in terms of how they think they're differentiating their business versus how their customers are seeing them in terms of the differentiation. Yeah, that's the fundamental premise of the book, right? The reason is because the way we define good, the way we define successful, the way we define effective, the way our industry de uh, defines good and effective, the best practices, um, the people have the benchmarks that you measure your business by, basically make everyone the same, right? So um, if the industry leaders define efficiency as a key thing, then you try to become more efficient and you're chasing them in efficiency instead of you moving into a different direction. So basically the idea is that homogeneity comes, sameness comes from us having the same definition of what we think we're actually doing. And when we allow other companies or in the entire industry to define what good is, 
then we're all moving in that same direction and no one ends up being different because we're all defining ourselves by essentially the same standard, right? So think about car companies. Most car companies are exactly the same. Their cars look the same. They sell them the same way. They offer them the same way. Then Tesla comes along and you pay for it ahead of time. You get a de- you, you put a deposit down ahead of time. They don't even have it. It's electric. It's not gas. There's constant updates instead of you get the model year that they put out the best car they can get put out at any given moment. There's not a 2014 Tesla, a 2015 Tesla. Everything about the way Tesla operates is completely different than every other car company. Um, And you don't have to wonder how is Tesla different, but that's because they didn't see themselves as a car company basically. And they ran in a completely different way. And then they've challenged the industry so much that the rest of the car Uh, manufacturers are starting to look at that model. Um, In fact, recent shortages had made some car companies accidentally do the Tesla model. I put down a deposit on a car recently because there's no new cars available at any car dealers. And so they said, we got one that'll be made on May 2nd. You want that one? Um, And I put down a deposit. And then when it was ready, they shipped it to the dealer where I was going to pick it up and I picked up my car. So now they're kind of going Tesla instead of make a bunch that people might want, sit them out, offer them at a discount, um, those kinds of things. So it's really just, we accept certain things about the way our industry works, the way our businesses should work, what customers want, and real differentiation usually ends up challenging those things in a way that if you, a simple example is from the book is Snapchat. Um, the founder of Snapchat had the idea when he was in his graduate school program, he presented it. There was even a VC, a venture capitalist in the room. He presented the idea. Not a single person in the room was like, that's amazing. You should do that. That's going to be a world changer. And in fact, everybody said, that's a terrible idea. Get rid of the part where the pictures disappear. That's stupid. Nobody wants that. The internet is forever. The venture capitalist said, get rid of that. And let's do a partnership with Best Buy. And if you agree to those two things, I'll invest. Needless to say, he didn't do that. Pictures disappearing became the foundational element of Snapchat. Turns out adults want their text to disappear, oftentimes because they're texting people that they're not married to. Kids like their text to disappear because then their parents can't see what they posted and what they said. And every other major social media platform now has stories which are disappearing, photos, articles, et cetera. LinkedIn even, I mean, LinkedIn and Snapchat, you almost wouldn't put them in the same conversation. LinkedIn has stories. Instagram has stories. Facebook has stories. We take for granted now that you can post stuff that will disappear at some point. And sure, somebody could screenshot it or whatever, but also think about the model. The social media company isn't storing that photo for all of eternity and having to have that on a server somewhere and having to pay those costs. Basically, every day, Snapchat turns over all the storage that they need to have. So that was a completely different way of doing it. So it looked wrong. It looked stupid. It looked dumb. It looked ineffective. It looked inappropriate. It looked unsuccessful, whatever you want to call it. And that's the premise of pink goldfish is that when you try to do something different, it's going to look wrong, dumb, bad, or in our basic language, weak, right? It's going to look like a weakness. It's going to look like a mistake. It's going to look like a problem. And so that's why you're not going to do it. So the reason to go back to your original question that most companies aren't different is because different looks wrong. And we don't want to do things wrong. We want to do things right. We want to do things effectively. We want to do things appropriately. We want to do things well. And so our basic message in the book is in order to be different, you have to do something weird and weird is going to look weak. It's going to look wrong. It's going to look incorrect. And that's the barrier that keeps people from really ending up being unusual. Awesome. And thank you for all those examples. Um, Before I go to the next question, I think what we're all wondering is the car that you picked up on May 2nd, is it pink? My car is pink. That car was not for me, but my car is wrapped completely pink. It has pink goldfish information. It has scales like a fish. 
Um, it has stickers from all the places we went on our 11,000 mile book tour uh, last summer promoting Pink Goldfish 2.0. And I imagine it's a Honda Pilot. I imagine it'll stay that way for years. They said it'll last three to five years. Um, it's basically, you know, like a nice little coating and a covering on your entire car. And uh, people love it. People talk to me about it all the time. It's a huge conversation starter. I, I bought a, another Honda yesterday for my daughter, a CRV. People were walking up and touching it. We saw them through the window. Everybody's staring at it. People ask about it. Even when I take it in the dealership to have it serviced, it's a, it's a constant source of conversation. So 100% my triathlon bike is pink. I have pink tattoos now so that nobody can ever say uh, that I'm not wearing pink. My wedding ring is pink. Um, this is a total, the light is pink. This is a total lifestyle uh, situation. That's awesome. Thank you. And I think you should probably send us a photo of the car because I feel like I need to see this now. <laughs> I will absolutely do that. Um, so I want to set the stage for the, the pink goldfish framework that you have. And I know there's a matrix where there's four different kinds of companies. So can you walk us through this matrix and how you think of being different in terms of the matrix? Yeah. So it's really simple. Basically you can do more, or you can do less, right? You can do more of what everyone else is doing, right? That's sort of following the leader uh, sort of a thing. And we call that um, the zebra quadrant, right? Uh, this is where you just, you zebras go in packs and you couldn't tell one from the other, right? And so this is with a follow the leader. Okay. Coca-Cola uh, makes delicious um, fizzy beverages and they sell them in cans and in bottles and through restaurants and, 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 and we're going to do so we want to sell sodas. And so we're going to do something very, very similar. We want to sell beverages. And so we're going to do something um, very, very similar. Uh, but then Red Bull comes along and they sell a beverage that I don't know, you could maybe call it fizzy. A lot of people would call it disgusting. They sell it in a smaller can. They certainly don't sell it in two liters. Um, it's not really made to be refreshing. It's certainly not thirst quenching. Um, it's got a lot more of the caffeine that's in these weird little bottles. They don't sponsor any of the same kind of companies or events that Coca-Cola uh, would do. And, and that's um, the peacock quadrant where you're doing more of what's weird, more of what's strange, more of what's unusual. You're going against uh, the traditional uh, approach. And again, the zebra quadrant looks good because it's more of what also would be seen as strong, right? Doing it the right way, doing it the appropriate way, sort of what we were talking about. So the reason the peacock quadrant is, is, is seems problematic is because you're doing more of what would seem weak or wrong or bad or ineffective. Um, and uh, over up on the top left is the cow quadrant. So again, cows, you can't tell one from the other. Uh, and this is where you're doing less of what's weird, unusual, um, and those kinds of things, because you're afraid, right? Why would I do why would I do more of, of what's weird and unusual and bad, right? And weak and wrong and ineffective. And then down in the bottom left is what we call the polar bear quadrant. And this is where you're doing less of what would be normal, right? Other people are doing that. We're not going to do that. Other people offer this. We don't offer that. Other people are moving in that direction. We're not moving in that direction. So your basic options for differentiation are to do more of what people already think of as weird or strange or odd um, and also bad. That's really the key. More of what people would see as bad uh, and as a bad idea. Um, and then the other way is to do less of what people think of as good and right and appropriate um, for your particular interest. So for example, everybody else is, I mean, th this happens. Uh, <laughs> I, I spoke for Vern's scaling up summit and then I vote, spoke for his scaling up summits in Amsterdam, Berlin and Barcelona, right? And so sometimes people come up to me at those kinds of things and I'm a speaker, I'm a, so a solopreneur, right? I have a lifestyle business as people call it. And people will tell me, Dave, your business doesn't scale, right? So in their mind, the right way to do things is build something you can scale and sell. And so when mine doesn't scale to sell, or it doesn't seem to be set up that way, they're trying to help me, right? Dave, you're doing it wrong, right? But here's what always happens. First of all, um, in the one in Berlin, I was the highest rated speaker 
at an event about growing your business. And one of my messages was maybe you shouldn't grow your business. Maybe small is good for you. Maybe you're a person who likes to work with three or four people. Maybe you want to be medium sized. Maybe you want to have a lot of close contacts. Maybe you don't want to systematize. Maybe you like doing the work. That's me. I like speaking. Maybe you like doing the work in your business. So I was the highest rated speaker at a scaling up event when I told people maybe scale down, maybe scale back. Right. So that's hard to do. Right. So conventional wisdom would say, Dave, don't say that out loud. No one's going to like that. But in fact, some of the people needed to hear that, even though they had selected an event designed to teach them to scale up that resonated with them. I didn't tell them nobody should. Right. Scaling up is stupid. See, that's the thing. I don't go to scaling up things and say scaling up is wrong. But then people come to me and say, Dave, your thing doesn't scale. Well, that's because you're assuming I'm trying to do that. Right. So that's one example. Everybody's trying to go international. You decide to stay national. Everybody's trying to go national. You stay local. Everybody's trying to expand regionally and you stay local. All these kinds of things. And we're seeing a lot of, there's a lot of examples of that being successful, but unless you're paying attention or thinking about that, it can feel like that's the only way to do it. We're just trying to show you there's a lot of different ways to do those kinds of things. Great. And so I know that you have like eight, kind of principles or ways that you can be different as part of the pink goldfish methodology. Can you help us kind of understand from a high level what those eight are? Yeah. The main one is F flaunting, right? It starts with F every, it spells out flossom, right? Your flaws make you awesome, right? That our imperfections are what make us different. And those differences are what make us special and draw customers to us um, and make our businesses um, successful. So it starts with F and F is for flaunting. Flaunt means to parade without shame. It means to be unapologetic, right? Unapologetic about our uniquenesses, unapologetic about our flaws and our organization's imperfections. So one of my favorite examples of that is Alamo Draft House Cinema. So Alamo Draft House Cinema has a no talk. They're a movie theater. They also sell food and drinks that you can have during the movie, but they have a very strict no talking, no texting policy. Um, They have other stuff as well, but we'll focus on that for now. So you get a warning and then they kick you out. If you're talking or texting, you get one warning, then they kick you out. So this lady got kicked out. She got mad. She left a nasty voicemail. What do most companies do in that situation? They apologize. We're so sorry. Would you like a coupon? We're, ups- we're sorry that we made you upset. Please don't tell anybody else that you're upset. What can we do to appease you to make you happy? What they did is they took her voicemail, they transcribed it, they turned it into a public service announcement that they show at the beginning of their movies. Uh, and they basically brag about the fact that they kicked this lady out. And when she says, I'm never coming back, they're like, thank you for not coming back. And it's a message to everybody there. If you're like this, don't come here, right? And if you don't like people like that, come here because people like that don't come here, right? So that's flaunting. Not only did they not apologize to her, they made her even more upset, which is the other one that we talk about antagonizing. Instead of trying to satisfy their customers, they deliberately antagonized that woman because they recognize she's not one of their customers, right? And so most companies won't do that. They won't antagonize anybody because they're trying to satisfy everybody. And in their effort to satisfy everybody, they're actually making a lot of people really upset. So flaunting is one, antagonizing is another. And the second one is lopsiding. This is doing more of what everyone else is trying to do less of. So for example, Hardee's, when all the fast food companies after Super Size Me were making their meals healthier and McDonald's is offering yogurts, fruit, salad, and water, Hardee's comes up with the thick burger, right? And they put a, you know, you're from Philly. They put a Philly cheesesteak on top of a two third pound burger. They take an unhealthy sandwich and put it on top of an unhealthy sandwich, serve it with a size of you know, chili cheese fries um, and a milkshake, and they don't apologize for it, right? They sell the $5 bag, which is 40,000 calories of food to some, some guy who's probably working construction somewhere and pulling through the drive through in his pickup truck. And he isn't trying to have a salad and he's burning those calories and he wants the most amount of food for the least amount of money. They weren't trying to do, they did more unhealthy, more fat, more calories, more sugar. When the whole industry was going fruit, yogurt, salad, water, um, wraps, all these kinds of things. And then 10 years later, what happened? 
McDonald's realized nobody was buying fruit, yogurt, salad, and water. So the leader, McDonald's, ended up following the follower, Hardee's, because Hardee's veered off at some point and created their own identity as the place where, it, you know, here's the dirty little secret, fat tastes good, right? Sugar tastes good. Um, and people want to eat food that tastes good. It's not your job to make people eat healthy and, and, and it's not wrong for somebody to crave those kinds of foods. Um, so those are a few of the examples of, of kind of the framework that we created. So we go through the FLOSSUM, it's an acronym. And so we have one for each withholding is the opposite of lopsiding. It's doing less of what everybody's trying to do more of. So again, everybody's offering more locations. You say we have one, people are being open till midnight, we close at five, right? It's, it's Chick-fil-A closed on Sundays, for example, right? It's not Black Friday. Um, REI doesn't have Black Friday sales. They shut down on Black Friday. They don't even open their website. They pay their employees and they encourage everybody to go outside. So they're doing less. They're not opening up on Thanksgiving for Black Friday, right? They're doing less of what everybody else is doing more of. Um, the S is for swerving. And this is just to let people know if they're like, geez, Dave, you know, I'm supposed to completely go against everything in my industry. Swerving's like, look, just make a move, right? Start small, do something. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't put pink tattoos on my arms on day one. I wore some pink shoes. I told some funny stories about how living with all women is turning me into a woman. People liked it. I got some pink socks. I got some pink pants. I threw on a pink shirt. The pink was an evolution right? Your uniqueness can be an evolution. You can start small. That's what swerving is. Um, and, and opposing is the O. Opposing is not <laughs> slight. It's doing the opposite of what everybody else is doing, right? Little mismatch sells socks in sets of three, not in pairs. They don't match. They're not the same color. They're not the same style, right? Every sock that's ever been sold basically in history was sold in a pair that matched with the other one. Right. And they came along and said, what if we sold socks to girls and they were different lengths and different colors and different patterns? And what if we sold them in sets of three and they were designed to be worn mismatched? Right. What if we question everything about the way this is done? Right. So that's the O M is micro weirding a little bit like swerving. It's like, look, you know, find small ways to be unique. There's little things you can do um, to stand out. The Magic Castle Hotel. Um, in California has a popsicle hotline next to their pool. You pick it up, they bring you free popsicles, white glove, silver tray. You don't have to pay for it. You can have as many as you want. Nobody ever leaves the four seasons and like, this is bull crap. There wasn't a strong popsicle game at the four seasons, right? That's never a complaint, but on TripAdvisor, Magic Castle Hotel is one of the top rated hotels in the entire Los Angeles area, which by the way, has a few hotels because people get so pumped about the popsicles. Um, they do other things too, free snacks. You can get as many candy bars as you want from the front desk. None of this mini bar, you know, inflation, um, sort of uh, price gouging. You can get as many sodas as you want from the front desk. They have a free ice cream machine. They just do things that no one complains about not having at other places, but they just do things differently and everybody has to talk about it. And then E is new for... Um, for Pink Goldfish 2.0, it's exposing. So Snowbird in Utah is a ski resort and their ad campaign was their one-star reviews. You know, They just put it on a magazine, put it on a billboard, just a cool picture of Snowbird with somebody's one-star review with no explanation, no argument, no, they're wrong, we're better than that. You know, things like too advanced. We felt like we were taking our lives in our hands. And the message is, if it's too advanced for you, don't come here. We are advanced. And we think too advanced is going to draw the right people and push the wrong people away, right? So that's exposing a Nebraska's new brand campaign after uh, years of being the lowest rated state in the United States for tourism. They came out with a tourism campaign that says, Nebraska, honestly, we're not for everyone, right? Uh, and that exposing that honesty, that, that genuineness, that authenticity, again, is very uncommon. It's not industry standard really anywhere. And yet their campaign went so viral, they were talking about it on morning shows in Australia. So now maybe people in America haven't been going to Nebraska. Now people from Australia are going to Nebraska because they just said, you know what, honestly, this isn't the most amazing place you've ever been. And people are like, but 
there's a lot of things that are amazing about it and that's drawing people in. So that's the framework flawsome. And it's just designed again, to remind you, your flaws make you awesome. Weaknesses, things that look like negatives, things that look like problems, things that look like mistakes, certainly imperfections. Those are the things that make your business different. And that's what draws people in. Perfection isn't what creates an effective business. In fact, it actually leads to mediocrity, um, being average, mediocre, and sort of invisible. Thank you. Um, so just a reminder, if you do have questions, feel free to type them into the chat. I thought I saw one, but I wasn't sure uh, exactly what the question was. Um, so if you could clarify that, that would be great. Um, but you mentioned a lot of examples and most of them are you know, B2C companies and examples. Do you have examples of some B2B companies who are also kind of implementing these weird different yeah. uh, methods? Yes, because everybody asks that question, right? And so first of all, there's, there's, there's <laughs> every business has people, right? So when you're selling to businesses, you're selling to people, right? And so there, just because something is happening between the businesses and consumers doesn't mean, so that's part of it, I think, is to remember that. And, and so that's exactly one of the mindsets, right? Oh, we're B2B, so that's different. Well, what if you took some of these B2C lessons and you did it in B2B, right? That would be unconventional, right? That would be a different way to do it. But one of our best examples of that is a company called um, HVLS Fan Company, high velocity, low speed fans, super sexy, right? And they're selling them to farmers because when cows are cooler, they make more milk, right? That super sexy business, you know, big spaces, hotels, um, like covered verandas in warm places where people are waiting for the valet, right? That's who they're selling to, right? B2B. And um, so they're selling these fans and, um, you know, it's some engineer who started the company and even what a ridiculous name, right? There's no marketing in HVLS unless you're a scientist, you don't even know. I don't, it doesn't even make sense to me. I thought velocity and speed were very similar concepts, right? So for something to be high velocity and low speed, I have no idea what that means. So they kept getting these calls and they'd say, thank you for calling HVLS fan company. How can we help you? And people would be like, hey, what is this? And this HVLS fan company, can I help you? And they'd be like, ah, I don't know if you can help me. Are you the ones that sell those big ass fans? Right. And after this happened enough, they're like, you know what? Maybe we should be big ass fans. Um, but they didn't go there right away. And this is an example of swerving, right? This example of swerving. They just sent out a postcard campaign with the back of a donkey where he's kind of looking around behind you, but it's mostly the ass of an ass. Um, and they said, you know, do you want to buy some of these big ass fans? And people went nuts, right? Their customers absolutely loved it. They changed the name of the com company. They built a 40 foot mural. They started getting sued by the city. They couldn't put up billboards. They couldn't do free advertisements um, and offer free fans to the Lexington, uh, Kentucky airport because people said you can't have ass um, in a public space like that. Um, so it's tremendously controversial in all sorts of situations, but they become an incredibly uh, successful B2B company because they're applying pink goldfish strategies. They're opposing, they're lopsiding, they're antagonizing, they're just all the things that we talked about, swerving and all those kinds of things. So that's one of our favorite B2B examples. But again, remember every business you're selling to the people inside of that business, they are human beings too. And oftentimes people say like, well, we're in a real conservative industry, so I don't think this would work. First of all, be more conservative then. We're not saying be weird in whatever you think weird means, be the most conservative company in the most conservative industry. But also, else is being conservative, then if you're a little bit less conservative, that's going to actually stand out. When I wear pink glasses at a marketing conference, nobody knows. Nobody notices, right? Because someone's got a orange top hat on and it has lights on it. But when you go to a legal conference and I'm wearing pink glasses, when you go to an accounting conference, so saying I'm in a conservative industry, that's exactly the reason you should be doing these things because everybody else, their definition of success, best practices, those kinds of things, benchmarks is wear a blue suit, carry a briefcase, have shiny shoes, have a nice suit, all those kinds of things. And when you don't do those things, you'll stand out. 
Awesome, thank you. So we have one question uh, from the audience before we wrap up today. And uh, they're asking the business cases that you're talking about, how'd you do all the research to find these weird flossum companies? Um, so that's why Pink Goldfish 2.0 is so much bigger and so much better because um, it's we've just been flooded with these examples. So initially we just put something out to all the people we know. We put up a list, Lee, we got on social media and we're like, look, we're looking for companies whose weaknesses are strengths who are doing something that seems like it would be ineffective or wrong or bad or goes against you know conventional wisdom, but it's working. But basically we're looking for examples of companies who use their weaknesses as strengths, right? Companies who um, are doing things differently. And so we got a bunch of examples that way. We wrote the first book. And before we even did the audiobook for the first book, we had an hour of extra time that we put into the audiobook for the first Pink Goldfish version um, because we had all these examples that we started finding, but also that other people started telling us about when they heard us speak or they read the book. So I'll give you one example is um, from the book. I did this um, for an EO conference in Barcelona. There was a guy from Germany there. He's like, have you heard about BVG? I'm like, no, it's the, the rail, bus, subway, public transport system in Berlin. And they're basically abusive to, <laughs> to the citizens of Berlin, Germany, if they ever have a problem with the public transportation system. They literally said things that were so foul on social media when we transcribed it, when we, we translated it to English, we couldn't put it in the book. Right. So their approach is we're not we're, we're unapologetic. Right. We're unapologetic. Yes, you're right. The trains aren't perfect. And we have an order in for new trains and they're coming in 2035. Like that's the speed of a public transport system. Right. So in the meantime, we're going to savage you openly. And, and it's just turned into this fun thing. And, and people actually sometimes do it on purpose. And it's very unique to the culture there. It may not work in other places, but that was just somebody going, oh, I got a pink goldfish story for you, right? And so multiply that times basically a thousand. Every time we do the presentation, every time somebody hears about it, every time somebody reads the book, every time we have a conversation about it. And so even with pink goldfish 2.0, we updated it during the pandemic. And every day that we would work on a new story, we'd find another one and find another one and find another one. So Pink Goldfish 2.0, which came out last year, just has so many more examples. So many, I mean, we threw out a lot. We found so many good examples. Then it became a question of what's the best examples? Um, what are the perfect examples? What are the most amazing? We spend all our time laughing and just being amazed. I mean, some of these seem made up. I mean, one is a Harvard, I mean, think about this, a Harvard class at Harvard University called How to Speak Gooder. Right. Like that doesn't meet any of the standards that you think that a place like that. But this lady's an adjunct professor. Nobody has to come to this class. It's not a requirement. And by speaking incorrectly, purposefully in the description for a course, she's sold out. Her class has become famous. Everybody wants to go to it. And part of it is she's giving people permission to not be perfect, at least in our traditional standard of that. So it's just stuff where we just can't we can't almost believe that some of it's true and we just wanted to, wanted to share it with the world. But yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just kind of what you would call crowdsourced because once you start seeing this, you can't stop seeing it. So if you had this vision of this is the way business should be done, once you start reading these examples and you realize we're not arguing that business should change, we're arguing it's already is this way, but just most companies haven't learned the lesson. And so these other companies are beating them because they've seen it when nobody else has. Awesome. Well, David, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you to the community for joining us. Um, learned a lot and I'm excited to see uh, how our community starts implementing these pink goldfish uh, flossomeness ideas to, to get weird and get different. I love it. Awesome. Thank you, David. Have a great rest of your day. All right. Thanks.